if somebody sees you as a leader, if they see you as a professional, someone who's confident, someone who can be trusted, someone they respect, those are the people that get hired. Those are the people that get promoted. Those are the people that keep advancing their career and getting the opportunities. Welcome to Your Intended Message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, -one, one to few, or one to many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Ty Hosgen. Here's three facts that I think you should know about him. One, he grew up as a shy, awkward farm kid near a town of 800 people. Two, Ty spent 800 hours writing his first book, Elite Communication Skills. And three, Ty has eaten over, guess how many, 800 tins of sardines in his life. Ty Hosgen, welcome to your intended message. Thank you very much, George. It's a pleasure to be a guest here on your intended message. And I actually had a couple cans of sardines before coming on, so I'm well prepared. And Ty, good for you. I've heard that it's supposed to be uh, healthy food. I hate sardines. And I remember when I was a kid, my dad used to make them in the kitchen and I'd just stay away from the kitchen when he was making his sardines. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not sitting in the same room with you smelling those sardines. <laughs> we were in person. I probably would have had something else just for your sake, but for the virtual, I thought it was safe. <laughs> it works. It works. You got it. Good. And, and Ty, the book Elite Communication Skills, you wrote that book because... I wrote that book because I grew up first learning about communication well over 10 years ago. And at the time when I started learning, I was a young man who found everything so boring to read. A lot of the resources were just very dry, nothing very interesting or exciting. And so I was thinking, how do we actually get, especially younger people, to want to learn a little bit more about communication? So I wanted to write that book to not only enhance my own learning and give me a reason to do a lot more research, which I love, but also just to make it a little bit more lighter, digestible, a little bit more fun to learn about communication, especially for people that have shorter attention spans, which is probably most of us these days. Definitely, yes. All you have to do is, is look at TikTok to realize how short people's attention spans are. Uh, Ty, shy, awkward farm kid, clearly not a social center of attention. I'm mean, So how did you get from that shy, awkward farm kid to, first of all, being interested in improving your communication skills? Absolutely. It was quite the journey. And it really started when I had first graduated university. The only job I could get was selling life insurance at that point. So I remember applying for just dozens of jobs. And as you can imagine, I didn't interview very well. <laughs> so the only job I could get was selling life insurance. It was a commission only job. So they probably thought, yeah, what's the risk here? We'll toss this kid in and see what happens. So at this point, I had kind of got through life okay being that shy, awkward kid. You know, university, it's a lot of tests, a lot of papers. You don't necessarily need to be an extrovert or an outgoing speaker to get by in the education system. But in the professional world, especially if you're not a genius, which sadly I wasn't, <laughs> the communication skills are incredibly important. So I remember being afraid to ask someone, hey, how was your weekend in the office? Classic water cooler talk. Even that made me nervous. I remember just getting sweaty and getting anxious to even have a little bit of small talk. Now, if I was, let's say, a technically skilled person whose income depended on my technical skills, maybe I could have gotten by for a bit and had some level 
of success in my career. But because my job was based on speaking, having to talk to people about death and disease and disability, what's going to happen if one of those bad things happens? It became so apparent to me that, okay, this is something I need to get better at. And not only just to be successful, but also just to not hate going to work, just to feel a little bit better about getting up every day and having those types of conversations. So it was at that point I tried to resist for, you know, first month, month or two and just kind of hide behind everyone else, hide in the background. But because my income was solely dependent on me, it really became apparent that I need to get better at this and I need to get better at this fast just to have any chance of having a decent life at that point. Now, Ty, you you pointed out um, an an interesting uh, problem for people who are technical experts. They believe that their technical expertise is enough to sustain and grow their career. So it might come as a shock to them that, okay, yes, you're, you know, this, you're technical, you know, your field, but guess what? If you work with people, you have to be able to talk to them better. And so that must come as a shock to many of those technical experts, because I've uh, sadly listened to some of them speak and just wondered, okay, I don't think I'm going to listen to any more of this because clearly they know what they're talking about, but they're (laughs) delivering in such a boring way. What do you say to those people to get them to wake up and see the damage they're causing to their career? Absolutely. And so you can get to a certain point in your career just like that. If you're okay putting people to sleep every time you talk, if you're okay being boring to listen to and nobody really wants to have a conversation with you, nobody really understands you, you're just doing your role, hoping that you keep your job. Suppose if you're that type of person, you can keep doing that. But if you're the type of person that wants to actually grow in your career, you want to get better, you want to make more money, you want to eventually grow into a leadership role, then the technical skills really won't get you any further. It's all about the communication and people skills. And there's actually a really good study on this that's done by Harvard, Stanford, and the Carnegie Foundation. And it showed that 85% of your financial success in your career is actually based on your communication skills, those soft skills, the people skills. So if you're trying to actually keep moving up and you're not content just having the same job and the same wage your whole life, then absolutely the people skills, the communication skills, that's really what is best to focus on next to keep you growing. And going back to your university experience, and I recall certainly the same thing. Uh, they didn't teach us communication skills. They and, and they certainly didn't teach us that in high school. I mean, they taught us grammar, uh, and but they didn't teach us how to communicate with other people, which seems to me a big hole in the education system. It's a huge hole. Imagine how valuable this would be, even if we were teaching it to high school kids, right? If somebody could start learning as early as possible, that can absolutely transform a person's life. A lot of my clients are parents, and they'll even say, not only does a lot of the stuff work for me talking to my kids, even though I teach professionals to speak better at work, my clients will actually use a lot of these techniques with their kids. Because obviously, Believe it or not, clear, concise communication is also better for children. But the cool thing, too, is their kids then start picking up on some of this. And it always just warms my heart to think about, you know, a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old is learning how to speak more clearly, explain the reasons behind their thoughts, and speak in a simple way so that people understand them. Oh, it's, it's absolutely tremendous to think about. And regardless of what age you learn, the good part about this is that it's a learnable skill. Everything is a learnable skill and everything can be fixed. If you are not naturally gifted, like myself, genuinely no natural talent, no natural speaking ability, not naturally outgoing. Everything is a skill that can be learned. So that always brings a lot of my clients relief too, is that, oh, Okay, I'm not stuck like this. Thank goodness. Ty, what are 
the people that you work with, the clients that you work with, that you help with, what are some of the common mistakes that you notice right off the bat? The biggest one is, one of the biggest ones at least, is they are not very clear with the way that they're explaining themselves. So especially people that work in the technical fields, but it's really people that work in all fields is that, let's say they get asked a question or they're speaking in a meeting and they just kind of start throwing spaghetti at the wall, throwing out some words here, a sentence there, hoping for the best, hoping that something good comes out. There's a famous scene from the show, The Office, if any of your listeners have seen The Office, and it's Michael Scott, who is the, the head boss there. And he says, sometimes I just start a sentence and I don't really know where it's going, but I just hope I find it along the way. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people seem to do, especially in the corporate world, when it matters the most to be clear, to have people understand, to be persuasive, to be powerful. And so one of the biggest mistakes is just having no structure, no organization in the way that you are explaining something. You're just rolling the dice and hoping for the best when you open your mouth. What a great phrase. Sometimes I just start a sentence, no idea where it's going to go and hope I'll find it. Uh, and recently I attended um, a networking meeting and there was a speaker and, and after there were some people who stood up to ask questions. And I'm listening to the people who are supposed to be asking a question. I'm thinking, when are they going to get to the question? Because <laughs> they're just talking. And they went on so long that I don't even know what the question was, if there was a question there. Fortunately, the speaker did must have listened better than I did. And I've noticed that as a common theme, people start talking, I think, before they think. I think that's the problem. For sure. Part of that is a lot of people that I know are uncomfortable with that little bit of silence too. So they feel like, oh my goodness, if I take a second to respond, somebody's going to jump in or somebody's going to think that I don't know what I'm talking about. But having the confidence to take your time and take a moment to think if you need it can be actually the difference between having a great point or no point at all. I remember when I was actually in that insurance role, my boss was a bit of a bit of a stern, no nonsense type of guy. And every week we'd have a team meeting. There's multiple reps and everyone had to give their update for the week. So I always just wanted to get mine over with as fast as possible. And so I'd start speaking and I just wanted to say all the things I had to say and then get it done. And I remember once he interrupted me and he said, Ty, it's not a race. You don't get any points for finishing your update quickly. I can barely understand you. And that's just burned into my brain because it's really embarrassing at the time <laughs> to get called out. He did call other people out for various things frequently, but for me, that was just terrifying. Now, the thing is, he was right. Like, there's, there's no prize for just saying all the things as fast as you can. And when you're in a rush to answer, that's usually when you're not very articulate. You're not really explaining yourself well. I remember with other people in those types of meetings too, he'd be like, what is your point? What is your message? Like you would just, just kind of ruthlessly, but kind of hilariously, if you're on the other side of it, call people out for not being clear. And it happened all the time. So... That is absolutely something that everyone could at least be a more a bit more aware of is just taking their time to be more articulate. Mm. Ty, a team leader who's leading a team that wants to encourage their development, both as an individual, their skill development and their career, what can a team leader do for their uh, team to encourage better communication? Well, it's definitely not calling people out that aggressively in front of everyone. <laughs> it was memorable, but nobody really liked working for him. So I wouldn't say that is the best route. Mentioning ways to improve, but in a more observing, a more neutral type of way. And it takes patience and it takes effort, but really 
just being as consistent as you possibly can with praising every time the little things are done correctly. So if you're teaching someone how to be a little bit more clear or, hey, can you give that same answer, but just summarize it into the main points and then being aggressive, not with your interruptions, but with your praise saying, excellent job. Oh, that was so much more clear. Thanks for doing that. And a lot of times, I, this is a lesson I had to learn with my team members as well, is we think because we've t- told them something once and we've praised them you know, once every few weeks, that that's all they need and they're happy with that. But if you remember, actually being an employee, there's no such thing as getting too much appreciation. So just appreciating those, appreciating those little things consistently and accepting that it takes patience, it takes time, it takes a little more effort. I've seen that go a long way. And a lot of my clients that are in leadership positions, they've noticed tremendous differences in their teams, not only with their attitudes, but with their performance. Mm. And Ty, there were three words that, that you've mentioned that caught my attention where people can improve their communication. And one was about uh, structure and the other organize it, or being organized. And three was to summarize. So those in themselves sound like three powerful techniques that people can use to communicate clear. So how can someone better structure their message? Absolutely. This is something that should absolutely be taught in schools, structuring your message. So first, what is your intended message? This is something that you should know before you start speaking. I teach a framework that a lot of my clients find very easy and they find very useful. It's called the PRP framework. So it's point, reason, point. It's very simple. If you get asked a question, you start with your main point first, so your intended message first, what's really the main thing you want them to know? Then the reason, so why do you think this? Where did this point come from? Why do you believe this? And so you give your reasons for that, and then because people tend to hear and remember the things that they hear first and the things that they hear last the most, we actually want to restate our point at the end because we want the last thing they hear to be that main message. So we've got our point first, then our reason or reasons, and we restate it with a point at the end. The restatement at the end, very underrated and necessary because if you've ever been in a situation where the conversation just kind of gets off track, sometimes that's because somebody has ended their point with something that's a little bit off and people respond to whatever they hear most recently. So if we restate the main point at the end, it's a lot less likely those conversations are going to get off track. Mm, That's a simple and powerful formula to follow. And yes, I can certainly identify uh, listening to people who perhaps make a point early on, but then they seem to wander around and by the time they're finished i can't remember what the point was anymore or i'm too distracted by what they they went off on a tangent somewhere so if they could come back to the point and then i go oh that's the point yes now i remember what it was real simple formula point reason point i like that 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 in itself could improve a lot of conversations Absolutely. And if you want to expand a little bit more, then you can add an E in there and make it prep. Mm. So point, reason, example, point. So you can add a little example, you can add a story. And keep in mind that these things are best used in your professional settings, your meetings, when being very clear and concise is extra important. Okay. So sometimes people will think, well, do I need to use these all the time? You're having dinner with your friends. And the conversation goes off in a few different directions. That's okay. It's not a big deal, right? You don't probably have an agenda for a dinner chat with your friends. But I really want to stress that in professional situations, everyone is in a hurry. No one has enough time. 
people want the meat and potatoes of what you're saying and not all the sides and the desserts. So especially for any meeting that you're in, anytime someone asks you a question, PRP or PREP are going to be really helpful. And you're right. Having a, an example or story can be the most memorable part because I believe that that's usually something we can identify with. We can either see or feel that. Absolutely. And George, I know you're a great storyteller. And I remember in one of our previous conversations, you gave me some really good tips on storytelling. So I'm actually curious, what do you think is one of the biggest mistakes people make in professional settings when they're trying to tell a story? I think they're looking for too complicated. I think they overlook the use of simple stories, that we can use stories from our own personal life that is an analogy for what we're explaining, and then people can connect with that. And so I give the example, one of the examples I've given, when you talk about being focused on on your goal or one point or one direction, and you miss everything else that's going around you. And so I gave the example uh, once of I was at um, watching my daughter, youngest daughter, play soccer, and I ran into a friend, turned out his daughter, we figured out, was playing on the opposite team. And he asked me, he says, George, which one is your daughter? And I pointed at the field and I said, the one with the ponytail. And he started laughing and he said, George, they all have ponytails. And it's funny because I only saw my daughter because that's who I came there to, to watch. I wasn't there to watch anyone else. So I only saw her ponytail, not, not the two dozen other ponytails on the field. And sometimes we get too overly focused that we miss what's going around us. So there's an example using a personal story to make a, a message that people will remember. That's a great example. Something that came to my mind there was that if your daughter was the one with the ponytail, you have like 20 daughters that are the same age. <laughs> <laughs> you could have said, oh, they all, oh, you got a big family, George. <laughs> and yes, you're right. People seem to uh, are afraid of using personal stories because they don't see the relevance, but there always are. There are simple things that happen all around us. And Ty, when you're working with people, what do you do to draw out their stories? Absolutely. It's really coming down to what you said about thinking about just the everyday moments in your life. So it's actually easier to think of moments in your life, think of little things that have happened that caused you to kind of realize something or learn something, and then apply those to a concept that you're trying to teach or something that you're talking about at work, instead of trying to think, okay, I want to tell a story that talks about this particular message, and then I need to find something in my life that perfectly applies to that. There's a book that I read recently called Storyworthy by Matthew mm -hmm. Dix, and he talks about homework for life, which is really just each day spending five or 10 minutes writing down the one or two kind of key events or things that happened throughout the day, just to see if there's a little lesson in there that you can apply and make a short story out of. So I've started doing that. And if you can remember to do it every day, I have a reminder set on my phone. And to be honest, I still don't do it every day. <laughs> but if you can start just thinking of your life like that, then all these little moments will pop up. And I'm sure if you had said, oh, I went to my daughter's soccer game. No one would say, oh, I bet you there's a story in there that you can teach <laughs> a lesson from. They'll be like, oh, you know, did they win? Did they lose? How'd you play? Right? But when you have this type of mindset, lots of these little moments are popping up. And then it's just afterwards figuring out, how can we apply this to something that I teach? Because you could use the ponytail example and kind of twist that and teach a few different lessons from it. And that's a good point. Yes, there usually is more than one message you can take from an incident. And and it's just a matter of being uh, open to, to telling those stories. Uh, and Ty, when you're helping people who are mid-career 
who are ambitious and want to grow their career, where do you start with them improving their communication skills? Is, is there a, a, a method that you follow? Is there a, where, and is it a matter of mindsets? Where do you take them? Absolutely. So we've talked about one of the biggest pieces, which was the clarity piece. That's something that will often have the biggest impact is first, we got to make sure that people understand you, right? We got to make sure you're explaining things in a very clear, concise, powerful way. So once we talk about how to explain yourself, there's elements of the voice that we have to cover and the elements of body language that we have to cover. So what I do is I customize it for each person because certain people are doing certain things very well. Others are doing completely different things well. And the mistakes are varied across the board. So even a lot of the same things come up in that somebody is perhaps doing something with their voice like they are speaking too quickly or they're not pausing or they're using a lot of filler words or they're going up in pitch a lot. Things like that that will make them sound less credible less certain, less of a leader, or with their body language, maybe they're closing themselves off a lot. In certain situations, they've got their arms crossed or they've got barriers in front of them, or they're making weird eye contact. It really depends on the person. So it's customized based on what are the things that they're doing to take away from their credibility, take away from them looking and sounding like a leader. And then once we fix those mistakes, then we're going to optimize and we're going to fine tune everything. Again, the voice, the words, the body language. It really comes down to, especially in the professional world, whether we like it or not, it's how you're perceived. If somebody sees you as a leader, if they see you as a professional, someone who's confident, someone who can be trusted, someone they respect, those are the people that get hired. Those are the people that get promoted. Those are the people that keep advancing their career and getting the opportunities. You mentioned a few uh, challenges or problems there. Speaking too quickly hurts credibility? Oh, absolutely. A lot of times, if somebody speaks too quick, and this is a common thing that especially happens when people are a bit nervous, so our heart rate increases, we get a boost of adrenaline. And when that happens, it's almost giving away that you're not calm, you're not confident, you're not in control. Typically, too, if I'm talking this fast, I'm trying to make a bunch of great points and I'm trying to sound really important and say a lot of good stuff. You're not really picking up on what I'm saying, right? You're just trying to keep up rather than actually absorb anything useful that I might have to tell you. So that is one of the probably the biggest mistakes that I see is just not feeling comfortable keeping the pace under control. And speaking too quickly seems to be more common with younger people. Why do you think that is? That's a very good question. I'm going to give a hypothesis that they're more likely to be nervous and be judging themselves. Depends how young and how old we're talking here, too. <laughs> well, almost everybody's younger than me these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be my guess, is that they're likely to be harder on themselves and then actually feel more nervous and that they're being judged more versus somebody who's a bit older and maybe just doesn't care as much at this point. It's a good question. I've never thought about that. That would be my hypothesis so far. Mm, mm. And... Being afraid to pause, why do you think that is? I actually had this conversation with one of my clients the other day, and I asked them why they were afraid to pause. They said, well, I don't want to get interrupted, and I don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, we're not talking about pausing for 10 seconds, <laughs> giving a long, dramatic pause. We're talking about pausing for one second, two seconds. People are not comfortable with silence because they feel like they always need to be talking. And if they're not talking, then the world is going to explode and everything is going to end. <laughs> if you've ever been on the side of feeling like you pause for a really long time, 
And if you've ever been lucky enough to have recorded that moment, if you actually hear the pause and you are on the other end of a pause, it sounds way shorter and it actually sounds pretty powerful. But when you're in the moment, the pause to you feels like 10 seconds, 20 seconds when it's actually one second. So it's also the warped perception of time that happens when we're speaking and there's people looking at us, people are expecting us to say more, completely changes the way that we think people are perceiving it. When in reality, most of the time, you could pause for a few seconds in any situation and it'll actually sound intentional and make your point sound more powerful. Mm, mm, True. Uh, Ty, let's tell people your book, Speak Like a Confident Leader. Let's tell them about the course that you offer there. Speak Like a Confident Leader in Seven Days. That is a free course at your website. And we have that description, that link in the description below. Who's that course for? What will they get from it? Absolutely. So that course is for anyone who has already had some success in their career and they either want to get into a leadership position or they're in a leadership position and they feel a little bit out of place. They've got a little imposter syndrome. And so they want to really speak and present themselves like that confident leader. Okay. So this covers everything from, we covered the three main areas, right? This covers everything from our words, body language, and voice. Okay. So there's seven days in, of seven videos. And there's a training you can do each day. If you do about five, 10 minutes per day with each of the seven days, you're going to become a better speaker than probably 95% of people because the advantage of learning about communication is that very few people actually put any time into it. People will think, well, I speak all the time. I'm pretty good at it. (laughs) But just because you speak a lot doesn't mean you're skilled. And that's something that a lot of extroverts that I work with even find they think comfort with speaking equals skill with speaking, which is not the case. And then for the introverts, there's even fewer introverts that work on their speaking. So even if you put in five, 10 minutes per day over these seven days, following the tips, you're going to be amazed at how much progress you can make and how much more confident you'll look, feel, and sound. Mm, sounds like that'll give them a competitive advantage in their career, uh, investing only up to 10, 10 minutes a day for seven days, just around an hour's time for a week to improve uh, communication skills. And there's no charge. What a terrific return on their investment just for a little bit of time. Ty, as we prepare to wrap up, if you could sit down with a team leader who has noticed that they have members on their team who are weaker at communication skills, especially when they have the meetings, if you could give that team leader advice on how they can uh, help develop those team members, how they can help them develop the communication skills of the team members, if that would be one, two, or three pieces of advice, what would you offer? Absolutely. So other than going to how to speak better and getting the free course, (laughs) we need to acknowledge that these things do take time and they take consistency. So as a team leader, you have to decide, am I going to spend a little bit of time each week with them? Or am I going to bring someone else in to spend a little bit of time each week? And I say a little bit of time each week because I've done many corporate presentations where you get brought in for a full day or a half day, or they'll do an event and they bring in a bunch of speakers. And it's it's fantastic. I love doing those. They're valuable. Everybody learns a lot in that condensed window. But most people don't actually implement the things that they learn. They take all these notes. They try things for maybe the next week and then most people just go back to speaking how they were before. Now, it's not their fault. No one's lazy. That's just the way that our human nature is. So for companies and teams, if you have the time and you want to invest time consistently 
with them or bring someone else in, as long as it's consistent, giving them feedback, here's what you did great, here's what you still need to work on, and being patient. Because if you think you're just going to speak to them for an hour or do one session and everyone's going to be amazing and perfect for the rest of time, that's just not the way that it works. So that's it's a wake-up call that a lot of organizations need is that it does take way more consistency than you think. Mm, valuable advice there, Ty. Too many people think that the fix for any skill set is, well, well, we'll get a half day or a full day of training and we can mark that off as done. But the results, if they really want results, it's consistency and attention over time, which makes the real results. My guest today is Ty Hosgen, reminding you that when it's your turn to speak, you don't want to be thinking, I start talking and I don't know where the sentence is going to go and I hope that I find where it will. Don't let that be you. If you like what you heard, tell your friends and post your five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps more listeners find us. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok. <music>